somewhat less attended than the boys. But we were neither the madman generation nor the media bombarded generation of today. I was aware that one day there may be fewer jobs in the boardroom or in Congress for women, but Canterbury did a very good job of giving us all the same tools and empowering us all with the same confidence with which to deploy them. So I went off to Tufts where I studied international relations in English, determined to become the heir apparent to the famous female war correspondent, Christian Amanpour. CNN was really born in my junior year at university, where the live coverage of the first Gulf War in Kuwait had taken place, and I wanted in. I continued with the international program at Tufts that combined with the Graduate Fletcher School. But a summer job in reporting took me off to interview all of the people that I had been studying, doing the daily newspapers at the World Bank and IMF meetings. And this was intoxicating, so intoxicating that I decided to stay. Clearly still in a rush, I did not return to finish the graduate school and went on from this job to NBC to make my way on air towards the Amanpour goal. Only I had one problem. I was broke. These jobs paid very little, particularly at entry level, where the substance of the reporting had little to do with the intricate balance of power in a complex geopolitical setting and much more to do with alligators eating small dogs in southern Florida. So I moved home to afford to be able to continue pursuing my Amanpour dream and took a side job helping my stepfather, who ran a hedge fund, to make some extra money while I continued to bombard CNN with pleas. But as one thing leads to another, the financial click career I had initially so eschewed became more and more appealing by the day. I had always understood finance to be synonymous with large corporate cultures and had no understanding of the various forms it could take. Lo and behold, I was good at trading, trading, took to it like a fish to water. Soon I ran my own book, as they call it, and soon thereafter my own hedge fund. This was a very long time ago and it was uncharted territory. I continued to ride this adrenaline-driven, reflexive, intensive wave until the birth of my second son, who made me look really smart, as I was fortunate to have given money back to investors just before the tech bubble burst. I felt even with the finely tuned female multitasking skills, I still couldn't have my hand on the trigger, eye on the ball, and rock the cradle simultaneously. My first child was still only 16 months old, and for once I made a practical decision. This was a particularly good one, it turns out, for me, my children, and my investors. I went back to work again after my third child started school. She was born immediately on the heels of the, of the second child and is sitting here with me now as my co-pilot and technician. <laughs> this is Louisa, and Louisa is already an ardent junior philanthropist with a penchant for pandas and is probably wearing enough of the bracelets she designed to raise money for them to, su to support an entire bamboo forest park. I'm quite sure she'd be happy to tell you about it if you dare ask. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at work, I then helped my father, as opposed to my stepfather, launch a new business, sourcing private equity type deals and raising money for his company to act upon them. And then went on from there to specialize in sourcing and raising capital for f alternative investment opportunities for investors that range from the foreign government entities known as sovereign funds, to pensions and endowments, banks and large family offices, all looking for good ideas and ways to make money, but with very different needs or risk tolerances. Because of world trends, this means, meant I became somewhat of a specialist in commodities. There has been a real global jockeying for position to control the world's resources, which has kept me very busy. This brought me back to the countries and places I originally sought when I began my career traipsing around Africa, Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East, linking up supply with demand. So if there is advice to anyone here still listening to me about through this personal history part of my talk, it is that if you follow your nature, there are many paths to your goals. Having goals is absolutely a good thing, but don't get hung up on whatever it may be and end up at a standstill when it isn't magically materializing before your eyes. If you keep doing in life just about anything, all sorts of new opportunities will open to you that you hadn't even had under consideration when you started. If one thing is undeniably true, the old adage, one thing definitely leads to another. So getting back to the seed that was planted here at Canterbury, in this process and along the way, I'd noted that annually I gave away about 10% of my income, whether I was making a little money or a lot of money. And so when I started my own company again, this time with my husband, who joined me shortly thereafter, 
Uh, we took the opportunity to get more organized and efficient about it and set up the Univara Foundation on the back of Univara Capital. There are so many good causes that in the past our donations had been reactions to appeals from all different groups, all worthy, but when I stepped back from it all and decided what mattered to me, this was my deduction. You can give food, shelter, clean water, medical care, but without education, nothing will change. And with education, instead of donations and handouts that actually strip power ultimately and cause dependency, with education, you empower people to change and help themselves. And if we are going to take on gender equality, it has to start here. As a woman who just emerged from the bloody ethnic cleansing in Darfur, I had the pleasure of meeting, said to me, made me cry, they took everything from me, but they couldn't take my education. This started off the inspiration for the foundation with a change through education creed that led to receiving all sorts of proposals. But the more I learned, the more I realized that the multiplier effect of educating girls was really the holy grail. Educate Girls Globally found me through a friend and client who teaches at the Harvard Kennedy School. And their approach had been so successful I couldn't help but get involved. And I now sit as co-chair with Dr. Barbara Herz, a 30-year World Bank econometrician who wrote the book, What Works in Girls' Education, along with Jean Sperling, who is now the director of the National Economic Council under Obama. It was founded by Laura Chickering, a longtime social entrepreneur and think tank leader. What I saw in terms of results and transportability was a program that could be taken around the world to help women by educating girls. It can potentially create a tipping point for women through the basic tenets of empowerment. The scale EGG is able to reach is unlike any other program because it works by making government schools work and in essence turns them into charter schools by involving the community and giving them roles and responsibilities. In other words, while every school built or child educated is absolutely a wonderful and worthy feat, what appealed to me about EGG was the potential to make far-reaching social economic impact that could forever change the status of women in their communities whilst helping their communities prosper. It's nice to know that I was not alone in my assessment of the program and the Clinton Global Initiative, or CGI as it has come to be known as the Oscars for Philanthropy, is featured egg both last year and again this year as the education model of the future in the developing world. So now if you'll bear with me, I'd like to tell you about why girls matter in terms of both improving their lives while also solving for many, if not all, of the problems that arise from the dearth of girls' education that lesser developed and even developed nations face, and about the program I believe can change it. Girls don't just matter, girls matter the most. One person in eight is a girl or young woman aged 10 to 24. Young people are the fastest growing segment of the population in developing countries, and their size will peak over the next 10 years. 